Welcome to the Cannabis Success Show. If you're a cannabis company owner or operator who's ready to scale your business, grow your profits, and plant the seeds to take your business to new heights, this show is for you. We'll share expert insights, industry trends, and actionable strategies to help you blaze a trail of success in the cannabis industry. Welcome to the Cannabis Success Show. Today, we're going to be talking about more about branding. Uh, I'm very excited because we haven't had a guest yet that's more on, on the branding side of things. We've, we've looked at different business models, but Phoebe, we're excited to, to talk more about, about the branding side of things. And just by way of introduction, our guest today is Phoebe Dupree. She's the founder and CEO of Goddess Growers. It's a cannabis edibles company. Um, She's leading science and research-based team of visionaries. Um, Phoebe has strategically positioned the lifestyle brand at the center of peace, calm, and relaxation. I love those three words. Um, we'll talk about the markets that you're um, slated to launch, but uh, Ohio and Illinois, two uh, really exciting uh, markets to talk about. Um, just to give a little bit about uh, about Goddess Growers is uh, precisely dose product line that delivers a smooth and refined high incor incorporating THC, CBD, THCV, and mother elixir. So we'll get into cannabinoids, um, very, very unique uh, product and, and really exciting to be talking about this. Um, so before we get into it, uh, Phoebe, can you just give us uh, your background and how you got into the cannabis space? Absolutely. Um, thank you so much for having me today. It's a real pleasure to be speaking with you. Um, yeah. I uh, originally, well, I'm a, a lifelong consumer and uh, supporter of cannabis. Um, and I started consuming, you know, as a teenager for social reasons around the campfire with friends. Um, in my 20s, I had a, a really uh, intense job in banking in New York. And at the end of a long day, I would use it to Kind of just lower my anxiety um, and kind of come back to that center. Um, and in my 30s, I had three babies in a row and um, they started sleeping through the night. And I always say I stopped <laughs> sleeping through the night and <laughs> cannabis is really, uh, it helped me to sleep. Um, and then my 40s, I entered the cannabis industry um, and founded Goddess Growers in January 2020. Um, initially, uh, you know, I um, looked at uh, getting a cultivation license in Illinois, but quickly uh, realized that there was a huge uh, opportunity for a brand. Um, and so I pursued uh, creating the Goddess Growers brand, specifically edibles. Um, I'm a 45 year old mom with three little kids. Um, I wanted something discreet uh, that can really just help me take the edge off sort of in place of that glass of wine at the end of the day. And in for for the listeners, when you when you say you you applied for so when you're a brand, right? Because we've talked to those who have cultivation and retail licensing in the markets that you're in, is there a separate brand for is there a separate licensing process for a brand versus a retailer? Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Um so there's no licensing process per se as a brand. The way I describe myself is I uh, think of Coca-Cola has their secret syrup and their beautiful mm -hmm. brand and they license it to franchisees. Um, now, Coca-Cola does own some franchisees, but then oftentimes they'll just license the brand. Um, and so I, I've pursued a similar model where I, I look for manufacturers that represent the values. Um, they have the right amount of industry intel, uh, capitalization, and a CGMP, Certified Good Manufacturing Facility. And uh, we will license our brand to them. And then my food scientist comes in and uh, trains their kitchen how to make our, our products. They distribute them and, and I uh, generate the sales. Okay. So when, when you have this type of, of business model is, so you're, like you said, your focus is on sales and are you connecting? Cause I always try to bring it back to relationships. Are you uh, from the sales side? Are you going out and connecting with retailers yes. or is the manufacturer part? So the retailer is your, your primary uh, customer that you're out uh, and connecting that's, with, right? That's exactly right. We're, we're really establishing relationships with retailers, um, educating them on our products um, and the value proposition for the end consumer. 
Um, and then we have to go through every state, as I say, like its own country. Um, so in Ohio, for example, there, there are um, a lot of approvals for your packaging, for example, and your formulations. You need to get state approvals, but that would all go through uh, your partner manufacturer who does have that cannabis license. We don't, we don't have a license. We're not interested in, in pursuing one at this time. Yeah. And how do you, um, when, when you're dealing at the retail level, there's, there's, there's two layers, right? Cause you're trying to educate the retailer. The retailer has to educate the consumer. And so how have you been able to, to work, uh, that, that piece of educating folks about, um, I assume how your product works, the minor cannabinoids, mm -hmm. um, and different things. You know, I find that the population of bud tenders, the folks that are selling in these uh, retail dispensary locations are incredibly educated and interested to learn about brands. And um, so you do you do have their ear to, to train them on, um, you know, why you made certain decisions, um, you know, why you have the cannabinoid profile you do, who your, your target customer is. Um, we are focused on anxiety and uh, taking the edge off really the journey to calm. And so all the decisions and, and selling points that we make are really about that. And then uh, we also uh, are starting a newsletter to provide educational material to the end consumer, in addition to the bud tender, to try and then drive traffic into the dispensary um, and you know teach them not only about our brand, but about the cannabis industry in general um, in ways that you can uh, safely incorporate uh, cannabis that's pr produced in a licensed facility, sold in a licensed dispensary. Yeah. And so your, your product is, is really focused on the consumer that's looking for really specific, uh, remedies, right? Whether it's sleep, calm, and really, uh, consistent. And that requires, um, right. Like you said, a lot of education, consistency around the product. Are you finding that is, is it in certain markets where this consumer base is continuing to grow um, versus the, you know, the high THC type of consumer where folks are really looking for that specific effect? Um, and they're looking for a form factor that is uh, like yourself, that's more uh, discreet or uh, such as the edible category. Yeah, um, <clears throat> I'm finding that. Uh instead of looking at THC level, thinking about uh, the end state that a consumer is looking for. And you know, if they are feeling anxious at times and looking for a way to take the edge off, then we would be the product for you. And we've, we are in market with varied levels of THC. Um, so the more seasoned cannabis consumer will find something for themselves in addition to a newer cannabis consumer or an, a more seasoned one that has a very low tolerance. I put myself in that category. I consume cannabis mm -hmm. almost daily, um, but in very low doses, you know, one, two, three milligrams, five, if you know, it's the weekend and I'm going to a concert. I, um, I'm the same way when I go to, uh, to conferences and I'm, and I'm socializing, um, having to having to socialize with with everybody and um consuming cannabis is just like i can't i can't stay awake so it's just <laughs> like i'm that same type of consumer that uh i'm looking for something very low dose and for very uh specific um effects um on my body that i can predict and uh what is what is going to happen there with with the dosage um so can you <clears throat> when you're talking about your product is there um uh, anything in terms of, you know, the manufacturing process that co consumers are, are looking for, uh, with the value of the, of the product or anything that you share when you're, um, working with, uh, different retailers, um, to, to talk about your product, essentially sell your product and promote it out in the marketplace. Um, you know, I guess the, the messaging is we're, we're the sum of all parts. This is a brand, uh, we worked, over multiple years with uh, plant biologists, neuroscientists, food scientists to develop a product that has a really targeted um, 
effect on anxiety for most people. And we even developed a proprietary blend of terpenes and flavonoids that augments that feeling of calm in addition to the cannabinoids we're providing. Um, the arrangement of cannabinoids that we feel is, is it's a hybrid um, uh, that provides that feeling of calm. And that's the mother elixir is the, the, the proprietary blend. I see. And in terms of, um, of markets, can you go back and, uh, and kind of talk about that, the markets and you, that you're in, because I'd like to eventually get into, um, uh, how those markets are, are developing. Um, can you, can you start with what market you're currently in and where you're looking to go? Yes. Um, we're currently, uh, selling into Ohio, which is a medical market that is about to flip into adult use. And uh, you know, at the end of the day, cannabis is really a medicine um, and should be treated as such with caution and care and education. Um, and you see that a lot in medical markets and then um, ushering in adult use and just really making sure that uh, the adult use consumers are, are educated. Everybody's endocannabinoid system is unique and everyone has receptors in different places. Um, for those of you who haven't heard of the endocannabinoid system, it's also referred to as the ECS. Um, it's your body's own weed system, essentially. Um, and it's a neurological relationship. It's not a physical one like alcohol, which can affect your brainstem. If you have too much, it can make you stop breathing. Cannabis will never do that. Um, it's a neurological relationship. And I always like to talk about it like the volume on your car radio. It can turn the volume way up or way down. But really understanding what your unique system requires in terms of dosing. Um, and it's not just THC. It's the the other minor cannabinoids as well. Um, it, it is a... I consider it a little bit of a barrier to entry for somebody that's never consumed because it takes a minute. You know, if you think about alcohol, mm -hmm. everybody knows who's consuming alcohol, how one glass of wine or one cocktail or one beer makes you feel. So if you're new to cannabis, taking that time, I always suggest at the end of the day when you don't need to go anywhere or do anything, you know, and maybe you're sitting in your bed reading and you can try a very low dose uh, of a new product, see how it makes you feel. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you, you brought that up and in and, and the comparison to alcohol. We had a guest uh, a couple of weeks ago, and uh, he brought up some of the language that we use in terms of how we, uh, like I brought up the hemp market and how uh, some states are banning what they deem intoxicating hemp products. And uh, he pointed out that it's uh, the language is actually incorrect because it's, it's not intoxicating um it's it's euphoric but it's really not a toxic substance to the body right and it, it's it's kind of what you described there is how it how it does work with your body it's very different from alcohol in the sense that many of us have uh, consumed alcohol for many years and so you know exactly hopefully <laughs> what you can and can't consume right and the effect that it's going to have on you but with cannabis especially in a in a market where uh with the consumer base that's that's the kind of curious or that's trying for the first time, it's really important to, even though it's not technically toxic to the body, it can have um, an effect that you may not want, right? So that education piece is, is really important. Um, the other piece I wanted to get to is um, the, the terpenes. And you mentioned education, and that's a big part of it because that is really missing uh, is the education around the terpenes, you know, I, I know I have my way of understanding, mm -hmm. uh, what they are, but it'd be great if you could share about that. Absolutely. Um, so I, I interviewed, um, the end consumer and ultimately decided we wanted to target anxiety. And then I started to think about arrangements of cannabinoids, but not just cannabinoids. We hear about THC and CBD a lot. And as you astutely mentioned, there's you know, over 120 cannabinoids, but then there's also terpenes and flavonoids, and those uh, can sway the effect that a consumer has as well. So uh, we, I'm of the belief that the plant in its uh, whole form is, is the best. Um, and then of course there's different strains. Uh, so what we determined is having using uh, full spectrum CBD, to offer that alphabet soup of minor cannabinoids in addition to THC distillate. And then I, I 
got a lot of feedback, um, especially from women. And I feel this way as well. I, I love to consume cannabis. I don't want to get the munchies. Um, and so we found that adding in a little bit of TCV, I also don't want to feel drowsy necessarily. I wanted to create a daytime high. Um, or, you know, as you say, if you're going out in the evening, but you don't necessarily want to be falling asleep. Um, that was the effect I was looking for, relaxed but alert. Uh, so we found by elevating uh TCV uh, and many people, it, it won't give you the munchies and it will provide a degree of focus in addition to that feeling of calm. Um, and then we took it a step farther and looked at terpenes and flavonoids. And uh, I developed a, a this proprietary blend. Uh, people often say, well, what, what's in the blend? You know, I say it's it's a lot of uh, mostly uh, on the terpene side, limonene and linalool. Um, limonene, you can think of like citrus fruit would have some limonene in it, like a lemon peel. Um, and then the flavonoids is the flavoring. We also have, you know, that that's proprietary as well. Um, and all of that goes on that path of relieving anxiety, providing a duty of calm. Um, so it was really thinking about the end state, the desired end state, and then backing into it with our formulation. Um, we do have a higher dose uh, gummy available in Ohio. It's 40 milligrams of full spectrum CBD and 40 milligrams of THC. Um, at that higher dose, I did not add the THCV because you know, as you alluded to earlier, uh, if you have uh, certain cannabinoids in higher doses, it, it can actually have the opposite effect. THCV is one of them. Uh, and we didn't want to create anxiety. So we've just got this one-to-one -one at a higher dose because it is that medical market. And we do see patients um, that that want, and more seasoned consumers, that they're looking for that uh, higher dose to attain that desired effect of calm. Yeah. And as you mentioned, this, you know, the combination of this can, it, it does provide a more consistent effect, right? Um, because I have purchased um, THCV um, uh, extract, uh, like alone as a tincture. And it's, it's just like you said, it's different for everybody. And I, I know that sometimes it has helped me focus, but I've done it. I've taken it other times where it actually makes me uh, drowsy. Right. Um, and so, the um the terpenes when when you're consuming in a uh, uh not the the full flower but um in a in an edible uh form factor the, do the terpenes have any effect on uh, uh flavor or any experience for the consumer or is that more just when you're consuming uh in the flower category i know you mentioned that it has like um the effect it, mm -hmm. it 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 has an effect, but it, does it have any anything to do Flavor. with the experience that the consumer uh, experiences when they're consuming? Yeah, absolutely. Flavor does play a role in uh, how you feel. You know, if you ever crave a food and it tastes so good, it's kind of what your body needs in that moment. Um, and then with the terpenes, terpenes can be very smelly and stinky, and you want to really use them in, in tiny amounts. I've found, mm -hmm. um, and then. We, I didn't talk about this yet, but we've partnered with Azuka, which is a fast acting ingredient. And it encapsulates all of the molecules in our edible. Uh, and it, in addition to uh, making it hit your system in five to 15 minutes, it, it kind of masks that the taste. Now, some people love the, the cannabis taste, others don't. You know, ultimately, ours does not really taste like cannabis at all. I can barely taste any cannabis. Um, or terpenes. Um, mm -hmm. I, I really like Azuka. All of their ingredients are approved by the FDA. Um, you know, we, we really uh, went to great lengths to make sure every input into our, our gummies is, is really um, carefully chosen and, and safe for consumption because it's food and you're putting it in your body at the end of the day. Yeah. So let's take, take it back more to the, to the business side. Thanks for sharing all that. Um, I think, I think our listeners will find that educational. And I mean, this seems like basic, basic things, uh, to those who've been in the industry at least some time or, or long time, such as yourself. But, um, I think th some of these basics are, are the things that, that folks need to hear because there's still such a large, uh, segment of the market that is, um, that is not aware of, uh, the minor cannabinoids of how terpenes and flavonoids work. So, so thank you for that. Um, but going back to, there's a lot going on right now, right? With the 
with the potential reschedule. But you mentioned being an um, asset light business model. You're able to operate in different markets, right? Yeah. Um, is uh, rec markets. But so when you think about it, um, you're essentially able to expand into any particular market that, that you find a partner in. Mm -hmm. Um, was that a big part of choosing this business model? Is that like, you don't have to apply for a different license in each state. And do you see that in your future? Is that, um, you know, there, we talk a lot about, um, or we've brought it up if we see a potential, uh, interstate commerce down the road, but that is just not something that really affects you under your current business model, right? Is any, in terms of interstate commerce or how the reschedule could impact you? That's correct. Uh, interstate commerce wouldn't so much affect us. I mean, there would certainly be some effect, but, um, I, I like the ability to, uh, be everywhere and nowhere at, at, provides us a degree of flexibility to really carefully choose our partners. Um, and then the, mm -hmm. this is a, a still a little bit the Wild West. The market has come so far, but there's still a lot of work to be done. Um, and being able to grow uh, you know, as we see fit, I, I really enjoy uh, that degree of, of freedom and flexibility as a brand. Yeah. What are you... Um... What are you most excited about right now? Like, um, obviously the potential of, of 280E going away, but um, what are you most excited about in the industry right now? Because, I mean, this is just really a, a big year, a lot going on, uh, policy uh, changes that are really pushing things forward. Perhaps uh, might start to see institutional capital in the future, but um, can you share what you're most excited about? Um you know, as far as the policy, the the rescheduling was a big deal. Um, it, it's I, I tell people that we're riding a snail, um, and that these things take time. Um, but rescheduling, uh, it, it won't be immediate, right? There's a comment period. It'll take a little while. It may be a couple of tax cycles before um, companies see that relief at the federal level. But not being subject to 280E is a, a huge deal. Uh, if you're considered plant touching by the IRS. Um, 280E, for those of you that are not familiar, it's a task code. Um, and as a schedule and substance, cannabis was a schedule and substance uh, is something that has no medicinal value, which we know cannabis, that's not true. They reschedule it to schedule three. Um, and it's great because now schedule three drug does have some medicinal value and it's not subject to 280E, which is significant because uh, it used to be you couldn't write off things like your employees' wages or your rent, which is a business owner, if you think about that, that's pretty egregious and it, it's, a, it's really hard on a business. Um, I'm most excited. I think the next step will be uh, some sort of uh, adjustment in banking to create a little bit of a healthier uh, environment financially for companies. You know, as a startup, I couldn't apply for an SBA loan, for example, because it's technically federally illegal. Um, I don't know what way it will go. It just does seem like uh, the motion in the ocean is going in the right direction. And whether it's a safe banking act, passing in Congress or whether the government legalizes at the federal level and then kicks it to the states to decide. And that opens up the um, some room for, for traditional banks to um, start providing lending. It'll, it'll just create a much healthier industry. And because you are seeing so much capital poured into the cannabis industry, I think it'll be a, an excellent next step. It's just anybody's best guess when that'll happen. Yeah. I, I've, I've just looked at it like, okay, the reschedule is not a, a safe, it's not a path to safer banking, uh, per se exactly like that. Um, it doesn't mean that safer banking, uh, will pass now, but I, I would say like, there are still plenty of banks that are, that are banking cannabis. I forget the number, but, um, there's a number out there and it's pretty high of how many banks are banking cannabis. The, the kind of side effect that it'll have is that to your point on 280E going away is that companies will just will be more profitable overnight just by a lower rate of taxation or not the rate, but just the effective tax rate at the end of the day. And so just companies have better credit and are more uh, banks are more likely to loan to a bank uh, company that is, has better credit that is more uh, 
that is more profitable. So I see that as a as a uh, not exactly a direct path, but an effect that it's going to have on cannabis is that um, it is going to Im- improve um, access to capital because just companies will be more can be more profitable with uh, not being subject to, to 280E. And then over time, uh, just by the end, by way of the industry, just, just learning, you should have some relief of the price compression that you have in, in almost all the markets as, as, um, companies just get larger and perhaps more consolidation. But since I always make the point that there is enough banking to go around for current, uh, cannabis companies, I say this kind of just anecdotally when I talk to, you know, folks out there from, from your standpoint, did you have any issues, um, just from a depository standpoint, getting uh, a relationship with a bank just for regular checking and savings and treasury management service for your day-to-day operations, or was that a struggle as well? No, that was not a struggle. Getting a checking account is fairly easy, as you say. There's plenty right. of credit unions, um, and I've found you know that to be easy. It's the lending that's the hard part. You know, and that's what the Safer Banking Act or, you know, legalizing cannabis at the federal level and having the larger, uh, you know, FDIC insured banks come in. It'll just you'll see compression in the interest rates that that are being solicited for loans in the cannabis industry right now are, you know, sometimes up to 20 percent, which is just ridiculous. And it's it's really hard to um, it, it's just not a healthy uh financial model to have such high rates. Um, so, so I would say it's more like on the lending side um, and, and, you know, providing that capital for companies once they have that proof of concept to really grow. Mm-hmm. Sometimes it makes, it makes sense to borrow, right? If your cost of, of borrowing is less than, than the profit that you're generating in terms of percentages, how I think about it. But when you're a, uh, borrowing at at a credit card rate is really hard to to justify like you said even if the lending is there it's it's at such a high rate that it doesn't make sense you'd have to make a really high margin to be able to cover that cost of of borrowing that cost of that cost of um of capital so um yeah one more example that i can add to my research study there that i have not come across a a cannabis company that has had issues obtaining a, uh, a checking and a savings account. It's more, um, uh, on the lending side. Um, as you say, Phoebe, let's go back to your story. So you have a background in, in banking. Was there a moment when, when you got out of banking and decided to get into cannabis and how does that banking background play into what, what you're doing today? Sure. Um, so I worked uh, in banking out of college for some years. And then um, I think I'm technically called a serial entrepreneur, maybe something in that category, because I went and started a business. I've always loved antique furniture. And I noticed that um, antique furniture dealers didn't take into account the time value of money. And so I, I started a business selling antique furniture for some years. Um, and then I took a pause when I had my babies. And around uh, that time during the pause, Illinois was going adult rec legal, adult use was starting in my home state, Illinois. And uh, I have a cousin that uh, has a vertically integrated operation in Colorado. And I initially went to him and said he should apply for a license in Illinois. And ultimately I ended up applying and not getting licensed and pivoting into this brand. And so that's that's sort of how I found my way. But having a um, that, that finance background, has been helpful um, just in terms of the decisions that we make as a startup. You know, it's so perilous. And I feel like, you know, oftentimes there's just a lot of shiny objects and maintaining the focus um, and making sure every dollar we spend is going towards helping me to get off of a shelf and, um, you know, illustrate the value um, that our product is, is going to provide and really, you know, providing the education that we're endeavoring to provide. So, um, I think definitely it it has been helpful, um, along the way. And when you say, uh, in that, in the antique furniture industry, didn't understand the time value of money. Can you explain that? Oh, sure. Not that they didn't understand it. I don't think that there was an appreciation for it. So um, what I mean is uh, if an antique furniture dealer bought a chair, a really beautiful chair, Mm -hmm. um, 
on day one and let's say on day 20, somebody offered them uh, two times their money. Uh, they might say no because they think they can make five times and they may, but it may take them five years. And when you model that out, it'd be so much more profitable. I mean, imagine somebody came to you in the stock market and said, hey, in 20 days, I'm going to double your money. You would be all over that. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, you know, doubling your money and then redeploying that capital and buying more inventory and then selling that over a faster mm -hmm. period of time. That's what I mean by the time value of money. Right. Yeah. That sales cycle. Right. Because that comes into play in the different verticals within cannabis, like you mentioned, your brother is um, it fully vertical, I think you said. And so the cultivation... oh, oh, cousin, my cousin, cousin, I'm sorry. Yeah, has a there's a different sales cycle from the time it takes to plant a seed to sell it to uh, a, a manufacturer versus a brand such as yourself, right? And so would you say like a brand has a much uh, shorter sales cycle? Um, than other pieces of the vertical? Uh, you could say that, yes, uh, because we are taking that end product of distillate and, and put it, you know, producing it into edibles and then uh, distributing it and selling it. You're, you're sort of starting, you know, you're not starting from the seed going into the ground, um, but, you know, you're, you're paying that cost. Like there's an associated cost of goods that comes with that as well. So it's not a total sweep. Mm-hmm. And, and education, uh, going back to, to the educational piece, um, you've been involved with, uh, policy a, a normal, um, where, where are you involved in, in anything that's, uh, uh, educational, um, agencies or, or something, anything like that, where you provide education to consumers? Um, you know, I, I'm a member of the Illinois Women in Cannabis, and I've been in a couple of their panels. Mm -hmm. um, and then we're starting a newsletter, Goddess Growers is, to provide a monthly uh, soundbite article on a topic we think is important um, to send into the market. Um, and you can sign up on our website, goddessgrowers.com. Um, so those are ways I'm starting. And then I've also uh, been speaking to uh, groups of women, any, you know, Y or um, a garden club uh, has been helpful. I'm very interested in talking to uh, the elderly as well. It's been a little bit more challenging uh, finding a speaker spot at a nursing home, but that's that's on the horizon, I hope, as well. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I consider our podcast is the, the education um, and destigmatization a big part of, of what we hope to accomplish in, in each of our episodes. And I think we did a lot of that with, with what you've shared about minor cannabinoids and terpenes and just your journey. So we appreciate you uh, being on the show and, and sharing your story. Um, I, think, I think you shared a lot that our listeners will, will benefit from. Before we start to wrap up, was there anything else that uh, that we didn't cover that you'd like to cover before we wrap up? No. Um, if there are any questions uh, that we didn't cover, you can also go to our website, goddessgrowers.com, and uh, there's some contact info on there. I'd be happy to, um, you know, I'd love to hear feedback and, and questions that folks have. We're, we're constantly collecting those. Um, but thank you for having me on today. It was a real pleasure chatting with you. Yep. Thank you. And um, yeah, definitely check out the newsletter. And is, um, are you active on LinkedIn? What's Where's the best place for people yeah. to find you personally? Mm -hmm. I'm on LinkedIn, Phoebe Dupre. All right. It'll be in the, in the show notes. Um, that's all we have um, for today. Thanks everyone for joining us today. And we'll see you next time on the Cannabis Success Show. Enjoy this podcast? Visit our website, anderscpa.com slash virtual dash CFO dash cannabis to get more tips and strategy for achieving business success in the cannabis industry.